In the second webcast, we're going to pick up on vasculitis. And vasculitis really sort of represents the heart of this lecture because it's the hardest set of diseases to kind of wrap your head around that we're going to be talking about here. So the first thing to know about is what is vasculitis? Vasculitis really means inflammation and damage to the blood vessels. And when you damage and inflame the blood vessels, you can lead to luminal obstruction, which can lead to ischemia, or you can lead to aneurysm or dilatation of the vessel. And either of these uh, facets can compromise end organ function, although usually what ha predominates is ischemia. Now, one of the things that makes vasculitis so challenging is that it's very, very heterogeneous. It has many different etiologies, and it has many different manifestations, all of which can overlap. So what we're really going to try and focus on is highlighting the differences so that the different diseases stand out in your mind. The next thing to know about vasculitis is that what we'll be talking about in this lecture are primary systemic vasculitides, that is vascular diseases, or rather vasculitis that is the primary disease manifestation rather than vasculitis that is secondary to infection, drugs, malignancy, or connective tissue disease such as lupus or progressive systemic sclerosis. So these are primary systemic vasculitides that we'll be focusing on today. So first, some commonalities about them. I think the most important commonality among these primary vasculitides is that they have an autoimmune etiology, or at least a presumed autoimmune etiology. Uh, and again, they have vessel wall inflammation leading to occlusion or aneurysm, leading to end organ dysfunction. Another really common thing, uh, which is a tip-off in terms of patient presentation or maybe on the boards, is that the patient often presents with constitutional symptoms. And what we mean by that is, is fever uh, and weight loss, fatigue, symptoms of that nature. And again, there's a lot of overlap in terms of these diseases, so we're going to work to split these out. And this is the classification scheme uh, to subclassify primary vasculitides that we're going to work through today. We're going to talk about large vessel vasculitides, that is vasculitis that affects the aorta and its uh, relatively proximal branches, medium-sized vessel vasculitis, and small vessel vasculitis, which gets broken out further into immune complex-mediated vasculitis and ANCA-associated vasculitides. So we're going to work through these now. And the first that we're going to talk about is large vessel vasculitis, which is broken down into giant cell arteritis and Takayasu's arteritis. These are the two major types of large vessel vasculitis you should know about. So first, giant cell arteritis, which also goes by the name of temporal arteritis. And temporal arteritis is a pretty descriptive term because this arteritis tends to involve the extracranial arteries, specifically the temporal arteries commonly involved. But really, any branch of the carotid artery can be involved. It, involve, it affects older patients, usually patients who are older than 50 years old, and sort of a classic presentation is fever, anemia, a high erythrocyte sedimentation rate, over 100, and headaches. Uh, so the headaches come from the temporal artery involvement. And other common manifestations can include jaw claudication if the arteries that are supplying the jaw with blood flow are compromised, polymyalgia rheumatica, which is weakness of sort of limb girdle uh, muscles, that is to say, shoulder weakness or hip weakness, and also pain. And a classic finding is that patients with polymyalgia rheumatica have trouble getting up out of a chair or have trouble combing their hair. This is seen uh, in close association with giant cell arteritis. Or, for example, diplopia or vision loss uh, may signify involvement of the ophthalmic artery. The way to confirm the diagnosis of giant cell arteritis is temporal artery biopsy. And you can see here that there's some giant cells uh, in the vessel wall, uh, which gives the arteritis its name. The treatment for giant cell arteritis is high-dose steroids, such as prednisone. So that's giant cell arteritis. And another disease that also involves large vessels is Takayasu's arteritis. And this arteritis involves really the ascending aorta and its immediate branches. So we're talking about, for example, the subclavian artery, the carotid artery. And classically, it affects women uh, under the age of 50, so young women of Asian descent. And usually what happens is first there's a period of constitutional symptoms, for, for example, fever and weight loss. 
before the vasculitis manifests clinically. So constitutional symptoms, and then let's just say a couple weeks or a couple months later, uh, begin to develop manifestations of um, the vasculitis, such that, for example, there may be a decrease in the peripheral pulse, giving it a, this other name, pulseless disease, or uh, end organs supplied by these blood vessels can be affected. So shown here on the right is an arteriogram. So here's the uh, aorta, and what you can see here is actually the catheter that's injecting the dye into the bloodstream. This is a pigtail catheter. And you can see that various of these uh, vessels, for example, the left uh, subclavian artery is very tightly stenosed, uh, and uh, some of the carotid arteries uh, are affected as well. So histologically, this arteritis is indistinguishable from temporal arteritis. You still have giant cells in Takayasu arteritis. Uh, you have inflammation across all three layers of the artery. And the um, main difference is the patient population that it affects and the uh, distribution of the vessels that are affected. So treatment here is, again, steroids and uh, cytotoxic agents. The other really important facet of the treatment is anatomic correction of the stenosis, either with stents or bypass if needed, uh, in order to uh, really restore blood flow to the end organs. So those are the large vessel uh, vasculitides, and now we're going to talk about uh, vasculitis that affects the medium-sized vessels. And the three type, types to know about here are polyarteritis nodosa, Kawasaki disease, and thromboangiitis obliterans. So we'll start with polyarteritis nodosa. It affects small to medium-sized muscular arteries. It's found in middle-aged patients. And really, there are three major manifestations to know about. One is cutaneous nodules. And it's, it's hard to find a good picture of that, but I suppose this is one of the cutaneous nodules that you might see in polyarteritis nodosa. This neurological syndrome called mononeuritis multiplex. And all that means is people have peripheral neuropathies uh, because of involvement of the arteries that are associated with these nerves that are in a distribution that you can't say is central. So that is to say, maybe someone has left leg weakness and right arm numbness. In a distribution that you can't put together in one central lesion, that's called mononeuritis multiplex, and that is seen in several different diseases, one of which is uh, polyarteritis nodosa. The third major, major manifestation may be renal uh, disease, you may get hematuria with this, with this uh, disease. It's important to note that about 30% of polyarteritis nodosa is associated with hep B. Hep B antigens are found, and it's not clear if these are just an association or if these are causal. So classically, the lesions are divided into lesions that are in the acute phase, characterized by transmural inflammation and fibrinoid necrosis and lesions that are in the chronic phase, which is characterized by fibrous wall thickening. The important thing to know is that stages coexist. That is to say, uh, lesions can be acute and chronic simultaneously at the same point in time in the same patient. Treatment, again, is corticosteroids and cyclophosphamide. Now, Kawasaki disease is different in that it's a disease typically of very young children, maybe two to five years old. It's mediated by a T-cell type delayed hypersensitivity reaction, uh, and it's thought to include endothelial antibodies as part of the pathogenesis. There's a classic pentad to know about uh, in Kawasaki disease. Fever, conjunctivitis, strawberry tongue depicted here, depicted here cervical lymphadenitis, and a desquamative type rash. The main complication of untreated Kawasaki disease is a risk of coronary artery ectasia and aneurysms. So shown here is a, a series of angiograms taken from a young child who developed Kawasaki disease at two years. And you can see progressively the coronary arteries develop these ectatic areas and aneurysms. So the treatment when diagnosed is aspirin, really high dose aspirin, 100 milligrams per kilogram per day, and also intravenous immunoglobulin has a role. The last medium vessel vasculitis that we're going to talk about is thromboangitis angiitis obliterans, also known as Berger's disease. Berger's disease with an E, not to be confused with Berger's disease without an E, which is IgA nephropathy, uh, a type of uh, autoimmune kidney disease. So that's a little bit confusing, but we're going to use the term thromboangiitis obliterans. 
This affects the medium to small arteries and is classically found in young, heavily smoking males, so males 30 to 40 years old, let's say. It can involve the nerves and the veins as well as the arteries, and it's very segmental, and typically the arteries that are most involved are the tibial and radial arteries. Classic symptoms of thromboangiitis obliterans include rest pain, instep claudication, Raynaud's phenomenon, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit, and limb ischemia. And the treatment is really to stop smoking, and it's very likely that further uh, artery involvement will cease, although patients may still be left with claudication. So shown here on the right is an angiogram of a hand, and you can see a lot of vessel dropout in the distribution of the um, radial artery. And shown here on the bottom panel is actually finger necrosis uh, resulting from the ischemia. So we're going to take a little detour next into functional arterial, arterial disease. We're going to talk about Raynaud's phenomenon and then go back to vasculitis.